So why is this such a big deal? Well, the uh, incidence of uh, fetalism has increased throughout the world, but especially throughout the Western world. This is a view of our own five areas. When you look at this uh, picture, so since 2000, it really took off. But what's important is that the most affected uh, age groups in this slide, so these are non-IBD patients, are elder uh, uh, people, so over 60, in particular over uh, 80, which obviously have a lot of comorbidities, and this is the result. So there is obviously substantial mortality. This has also increased from 2000 to 2010, so over a decade, more than five-fold. Now again, this is adjusted by age, so uh, subjects with comorbidities, uh, extreme uh, ages or old age, of course, are at higher risk, but this is a substantial uh, issue. So, so much so that basically this has emerged as the most important public health threat related to antimicrobial resistance. It has beaten both MRSA and VRE. Uh, in 2011, there were half a million infections in the United States. That's new infection, 30,000 deaths. That rivals influenza and the annual cost uh, you see there. It's well known that EBD, uh, that, that C. difficile is sort of attracted, it's magnetized by IBD. So this is a hospital-based um, study showing that the rate of C. diff among UC patients was many-fold, four times higher uh, compared to Crohn's, and they're both higher than other non-IBD-related GI hospitalizations or patients hospitalized for internal medicine. So this is a big problem. Obviously, the more colon, the more real estate in the colon you have affected, uh, the more likely you are apparently to catch the infection. And because we're talking about ID, IBD, that's associated with risk. So this is a, a review of uh, 12 studies, 35,000 patients. Pretty unequivocally, uh, everybody's showing that there is an increased risk of colectomy anywhere between one month and three months uh, following the infection. So it's a pretty serious uh, confounder. What are the risk factors? Some of this has changed a little bit, but recent antimicrobial use in advanced age tend to get together among the community acquired C. difficile. So these, this is the new trend over the last five years. Actually, younger patient populations with no antibiotic exposure have increased almost tenfold. Uh, being anywhere near a hospital for more than three days, having IBD, immunosuppression, serious comorbidities, gastrointestinal manipulation, including surgery, and then proximity to patients or animals with C. diff. And also PPI, the use of PPI has been associated with this. So what's new as far as antibiotic therapy for C. difficile? Well, now we have three strikes against metronidazole. The uh, three society guidelines, AGA, ACG, and IDSA, have dropped it from first line, so it's no longer considered a first line antibiotic. Fecal transplantation is considered acceptable or recommended in both immunosuppressed and immunocompetent patients, and we have a new class of drugs, monoclonal antibodies. So this is an older study, comparative study, single center metronidazole versus vancomycin, first C. diff infection. As you can see, for mild infection, there wasn't much of a difference, although there was a numerical trend. But patients with more severe infection, vancomycin was significantly better, faster resolution of diarrhea by a day and a half, with a relatively small number needed to treat. Since then, this is 2007, almost more than 10 years ago, there have been two additional randomized trials showing that VANC is superior to, uh, to metronidazole for any severity of infection. So with that, pretty much metronidazole was slashed off as first-line therapy. There's also slightly increased risk of resistance. And what's also very important is because of this recycling of the metronidazole through the small bowel back to the liver, it doesn't actually reach the colon once the diarrhea has resolved. So uh, it, that durability of response is less compared to, uh, for instance, vancomycin. So these are the two kind of uh, stars in the C. diff therapy, so vancomycin versus fidaxomycin, which is a bug-directed antibiotic, randomized trial, fairly large size, uh, showing overall first pass clinical cure identical, but the risk of recurrence was higher with vancomycin, and therefore, as far as what these investigators called global cure, so long-term uh, eradication without recurrence was a little bit better with fidaxomycin versus uh, vancomycin. Of course, this is now FDA approved. Uh, you see the dose there uh, for fidaxomycin. Uh, 
So these, the next two slides are probably the most important as far as antibiotic therapy. If you want some take-home messages, remember this is based on disease severity. This is the most recent iteration of the IDSA guidelines. So initial episode mild, meaning normal white count, normal creatinine, uh, either vancomycin four times a day for, t for 10 days or fedaxomycin also for 10 days. If neither is available, then use metronidazole also for 10 days. Initial episode severe, white count over 15,000 or uh, creatinine higher than 1.5. Same thing, but metronidazole is not even there under any circumstance. And then initial episode fulminant or complicated by uh, shock, alias, or megacolon. Higher dose of vancomycin, so 500 milligrams four times a day, in addition to vancomycin enema and IV metronidazole. So that's when metronidazole comes back a little bit. How about recurrence? First recurrence in general, we used to say that should be treated as the first episode. Now that has changed. So because metronidazole is really not used so much anymore, this is what uh, IDSA essentially recommends as a first recurrence. So a tapered pulse course of vancomycin, uh, recognizing that the evidence behind that is relatively weak. If vancomycin was used as a first-line therapy, then fedaxomycin should be used as a first recurrence uh, for uh, uh, 10 days. For second or more recurrences, again, vancomycin taper pulse, or this is sequential therapy, vancomycin with rifaximine. There is one study about that, so 10 days plus 20 days, one month total. Fedaxomycin again, but only 10 days, or FMT. And this is where the monoclonal antibodies also belong in this group. So remember, as far as recurrent C. difficile, that most C. diff patients respond to standard therapy, but there is a linear increase in risk. So uh, the, with each subsequent recurrence, your risk uh, goes up, so that by the second or third recurrence, the majority of patients will relapse. So this is an immune deficiency disease in some sorts. If you don't develop antibodies against the toxin, you're at very high risk of recurrence. And number two important message here, that the risk of recurrence is double right off the bat in IBD patients. Beware of some traps. These are diagnostic traps, so overdiagnosis in the molecular uh, testing era. There's several studies, basically two of them have shown that patients who are PCR positive, toxin negative, may actually be colonized, not infected. And in both of them, this was I think from here, from in California, UC Irvine or UC Davis, the two weeks outcome were no different in patients who were PCR negative if they were treated without antibiotics, just with antidiarrheals and supportive therapy. This study actually followed it up even longer and saw no difference in outcomes between PCR positive, toxin negative patients when they were treated with uh, symptomatic therapy alone. And another study from a referral center found that one in four patients referred for FMT for recurrent C. diff had actually a different diagnosis. So, that said, the first episode of recurrent C. diff is not trivial, especially with healthcare acquired older age groups, there is a significant mortality. Even for community acquired, these are younger patients, morbidity and mortality is actually uh, uh, significant. So this is the famous vancomycin taper pulse regimen. I think this would be a good take home message again. Uh, there is not strong validation, but it's been described in more than one paper. So uh, two weeks of the standard protocol and then two weeks of taper, as you can see here. But I think this is the key issue. So this is followed by a month of pulse therapy every two to three days, which is meant to destroy those vegetative forms that come out of the spores. And with that, the success rate has actually been pretty good uh, in terms of treating especially the second or the first recurrence. Then, of course, we have a monoclonal antibody, uh, bezlotoximab uh, for recurrent C. difficile infection. This was a very large program, two uh, trials basically side by side, and in both of them, this uh, monoclonal antibody to toxin A and toxin B was significantly superior to placebo or a monoclonal against toxin A alone. So clearly, you have to take out both if you want to have benefit. Uh, and of course, the pool data showed uh, statistical significance. But this is when it comes down to dollar signs. This is where we stand. Uh, obviously, these are retail costs, so uh, metronidazole, as bad as it is, is still very cheap. Uh, vancomycin has become quite a bit more affordable with the advent of generic forms, and then it goes into the NFL uh, 
uh, league uh, between both of them, uh, fidaxomycin and bislatoximab. So how about fecal transplant? I think everybody's sort of excited about this field. What it means is essentially putting stool from a healthy per a person into the colon of somebody with a disease supposedly to restore the microbiome. What are the sources of stool? Two main things, so patient identified donors require rigorous screening. It's very expensive in healthcare setting because we have to do everything possible to assure safety. But this is favored by uh, bootleggers, naturopaths, so this happens a lot out there in the community without our knowledge, and there are obviously safety issues related to this. We have seen uh, norovirus in the era before we used a stool bank. Uh, we actually had a GI fellow who got CMV colitis from transplanted himself for ulcerative colitis from his baby, from his um, infant with stool transplant. So it's not without risk if you don't do a good job at screening, and then it becomes very expensive. Versus stool banks, uh, which use large pools of donors, which are screened and batch, uh, only 3% of them are accepted. So uh, they do a very good job uh, at screening in and out potential donors. Uh, the stool is frozen and shipped, or there's now oral capsules that have been available for some time. Uh, the price has to be absorbed, though, by the center. So where did the stool transplant idea come from? Well, this is 1958. A Denver surgeon treated patients with pseudomembranous colitis. They didn't even know what was causing it uh, with stool enemas, and they got better. Uh, and decades later, we revisited this as last resort therapy, but we found out about this Chinese practice only a few years ago. So more, uh, almost 2,000 years ago in China, healers used human feces to treat severe diarrhea. And in, in the 16th century, they used infant feces called yellow soup. Now, of course, if you watch Gray's Anatomy, this was all uh, discovered in 2008. They did this in the middle of the night, and in the ER, uh, they were able to transplant something. Give a, uh, it's not the most weird thing that's happening in Seattle, I'll tell you that, but uh, it has happened. So ways to deliver this. Nasogastric, it's a bit tricky. It can be uncomfortable and unpleasant, and there have been some risks, especially aspiration. Uh, retention enema, variable tolerance, but it's cheap, so this is popular among alternative providers. Uh, colonoscopy is usually the preferred route for gastroenterologists, but it's a bit more expensive. On the other hand, it allows examination of the mucosa. And then there is the oral route, encapsulated uh, uh, fecal preparations with decreased risk but higher cost, especially for the patient. So what's the efficacy of FMT for recurrent C. diff? Uh, this is a uh, systematic review with meta-analysis, large number of studies, uh, seven randomized trials, a few are comparative with antibiotics. Overall clinical resolution, universally, it's over 90%, so 92%. This includes first pass and second FMT for some recurrences, but the range, the range there is fairly narrow, so very effective. And this is kind of the, um, uh, some of those uh, tidbits that came out of the meta-analysis. So uh, lower GI delivery is better than upper GI delivery in any format. Uh, even if the difference is small, that was statistically significant. There's no difference between fresh and frozen preparation. Uh, it is more effective than vancomycin for a recurrence, and that uh, relative risk was uh, fairly substantial or uh, different enough uh, that was significant. There is some uh, incremental benefit from consecutive FMTs in patients who relapse. So this is how it looks, that systematic review. I just want to draw your attention. This is the zero efficacy. So virtually all of them, no matter how they were done, showed positivity. There's no question about it. Overall effect, as I said earlier, about 92%. So why does it work? This image is worth a thousand words, right? So this is basically the microbiome. It's phyla distribution uh, based on microarray analysis of the stool. This is the recipient. This is the patient with C. difficile before they got a transplant when they had the infection. This is the donor. And this is the recipient now a week, two weeks, and all the way out to six months after transplantation. It looks identical as the donor. So the logic here is that you restore the microbiome. Uh, uh, you get rid of the, uh, of the C. difficile. 
Uh, remember, so the reason this was renamed Cluster Dioides is because Clastridia are actually good guys now, so uh, they, I think they are trying to avoid confusion. But is this really all the answer? This was a small study, but it was published in a high-impact journal in gastroenterology uh, a couple of years ago. So these investigators took five patients with recurrent C. difficile and they gave them uh, sterile fecal filtrates, no bugs, no bacteria, no organisms via NJ tubes nonetheless, and 100% of them were asymptomatic at six months. We really know what their C. difficile status was, but who cares? So their idea was that maybe bacterial metabolome or some phages or other cell components may be more important than uh, bacteria themselves. So stay tuned. Uh, this, uh, we, ha we haven't gotten the, the final answer on this. Is it safe? Well, overall fairly safe, but remember the infectious thing. We're transplanting a huge bacterial and viral culture. So things can happen, uh, especially when it's done sort of off the cuff. Uh, there are some issues related to administrations, uh, perforation with NMAs, aspiration, rare, but it has been described both with the nasojejunal uh, administration as well as with colonoscopy, of course, due to sedation. Um, it's more than a few case reports, and this sort of tends to come in a very low frequency, but it's consistent. So autoimmunity of some sort, so lupus, RA, Sjogren's, ITP, developing months or years after the transplant. There are a, few, a couple of cases of microscopic colitis. Some patients gain weight, and they obviously blame that on the microbiome. And there are now established cases of IBD flares following uh, transplantation. So this was the first one published about five years ago. This is from uh, uh, Colleen Kelly's group in, at Brown uh, with one patient who was completely in remission from the ulcerative colitis standpoint on mesalamine, doing great, then got C. diff, recurrent C. diff, and, and they had the FMT via colonoscopy. So they actually could see the colonic mucosa. The patient was in remission got the transplant, and two weeks later, severe flare. And since then, there have been multiple uh, such descriptions, small case series, uh, a systematic review, again, more than 500 patients. The pooled rate of worsening was about 15%, and it's higher for lower deliveries. So when you think about this, globally, lower delivery is both more effective, uh, but also riskier for IBD patients. Uh, C. difficile, uh, I mean, FMT for C. diff is less effective in IBD patients. This is a study, large study from uh, uh, Alex Koritz's group at the University of Minnesota. So these are all comers of which about 20% had IBD, so almost 300 patients, and they saw a significant difference, about almost 20% less uh, success with eradication in IBD patients versus controls. Also, pretty high rate of flare, at least in that population. One in four patients with IBD had a flare after FMT. Interestingly enough, there was a small fraction of these patients who had microscopic colitis, and their microscopic colitis also went in remission after their C. diff was eradicated. So all sorts of uh, uh, incidental benefits. Another unexpected benefit was this. So this was a true description of a patient who had, this is also from Brown, patient with well-established immune-mediated alopecia, refractory to topical dermatological therapy. This is one and a half year uh, after transplantation. The Boswell hair rest restoration group would kill to have uh, pictures <laughs> like so the research continues, but as, you, as most of you may have seen, there's now a big uh, contrast, and, and uh, uh, pharma companies have, are pitched against physicians who are pitched against the FDA and patients. But basically, the notion here is, yes, we've done a lot of research. If we want to develop new products, you really need investment. If you need investment, you need uh, some protection, uh, intellectual protection. Uh, uh, patent protection, if you need that, you need regulation. So it's kind of a, a vicious cycle that will see pharma pitched against doctors, against uh, patients, and all of them will end up at the FDA. Uh, and and o the future will tell if, if we continue to do this as, as we are doing now, we'll become a more regulated uh, process. So how do we manage immunosuppressive drugs in patients with IBD and C. difficile? There are more than 
small case series uh, looking at this. So this was a retrospective study comparing treatment with antibiotics while continuing immunosuppressives versus holding them uh, in patients with IBD. And they found that the, collect the rate of colectomy or death at three months was a little higher in patients who continued immunomodulators versus those who stopped and took only antibiotics. And combining two drugs uh, was worse than having one drug alone, but 90% of the time that combination was a steroid. They also found that PPIs and H2 blockers increase the risk of relapse. So there was a bias here, obviously, uh, patients uh, on immunomodulators had worse disease. Another study from Canada, large IBD database, found that steroids initia uh, steroid initiation increased the risk of C. difficile by threefold compared to initiating other drugs, including biologics. So infliximab and immunomodulator thyroperians had no association. And finally, uh, this is another study, um, again, looking at, at uh, steroid initiation after C. diff diagnosis. So this is a patient coming in with a flare. You find the C. diff, you start the antibiotic, and then you start the steroids. That, that sequence increased the hospitalization length by two days, increased the risk of colectomy fivefold, and more frequent ICU admits. The adverse effects were obviously worse in UC patients. Uh, and interesting enough, at least in that retrospective analysis, the use of immunomodulators in biologics was not associated with an increased risk of adverse events except for readmission. So society guidelines are kind of centered or congruent on this. Uh, the ACG, uh, this is uh, relatively old now, uh, conditional recommendation uh, saying that ongoing immunosuppression can be maintained in patients with C. diff, although dose escalation should be avoided. AGA, uh, a bit more uh, clear, I guess, uh, withholding immunosuppressive therapy in patients with uh, C. diff infection and severe flares cannot be recommended. Uh, treatment may be escalated if no improvement after starting antibiotic and there is limited uh, vitalism of data, but that is reassuring as far as treating C. diff. So how do we prevent primary C. diff infection? Uh, infection control works. Uh, there are several studies showing that all that stuff that we're doing in the hospitals is effective, contact precautions, hygiene case finding, antibiotic stewardship, one of the most effective interventions uh, on a uh, uh, hospital basis, minimize the use of PPI and p possibly the use of uh, probiotics, but only for primary infection, so to prevent the first ever uh, C. difficile infection. So this is that data with probiotics for primary prevention. I think what's interesting here is that single bug uh, products like um, uh, Saccharomyces boulardii, for instance, not effective, but when you look at uh, products that combine more than one organism in the probiotic compound, they seem to be effective. So it's possibly that we, if we have combination of bugs in the probiotics, uh, you can prevent the primary infection. This was a study from Boston, uh, hospital discharges, 100,000 hospital discharges, so retrospective analysis, but it, it's almost a perfect dose relationship, so keep that in mind, the association between anti-secretory, this is acid anti-secretory therapy, and C. difficile infection. So placebo versus H2 blockers, once daily PPI or more than once daily PPI, almost linear relationship for recurrence. So keep that in mind. Uh, perhaps if you, have the, if you have the opportunities to, to turn down the dose a little bit. And then investigational drugs of these, the most promising appears this, which is an even more selective antibiotic for C. diff. So it, it has a, a even less impact on the overall microbiome compared to fedaxomycin. I think that's now in phase three. So in conclusion, uh, C. difficile infection has increased substantially in the last uh, three decades. Patients with IBD are particularly at risk. Vancomycin should be first-line therapy. Uh, recurrent C. difficile is common, but beware of false positives. Fecal transplant is a valid treatment for recurrent C. difficile, as is pulse taper vancomycin. Immunosuppressive medications do not need to be withheld in IBD patients, except for perhaps lowering the steroids. And that was the last slide. Thank you very much.